Good afternoon. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today, and I'm thrilled to see the number of people who've um, chosen to participate in such a special event and the number of you who've chosen to attend. Um, it's really gratifying to see everyone here. I have to say it feels totally unnatural to stand on this, um, but who would have guessed that they would want me to be on a, on a pedestal? It might be the first time <laughs> in my life. So I, I informally think of this uh, uh, presentation as, well, we'll see what I think it is. OK. How to start a mill, or maybe more accurately, how not to start a mill. Uh, I will address later the question that I get asked most often, which is why, 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 why? But here's, here's the basic introduction to how to start a mill. You need to get a building. And uh, be prepared for that to take some time. We started looking for a building in uh, the year 2000. And we found a building in 2006. Uh, it's a long story of what happened in between there, but we don't have time. But uh, if you want to know uh, th the short answer, it's that uh, local politics can be quite challenging. So you need to get equipment. That seems very straightforward and simple, um, but indeed it is not, uh, especially if you have fi some financial constraints and you're not uh, working with an unlimited budget. That means that you're buying used equipment. And anyone here knows that you can only buy what's available. And in the used market, that can be quite limited. So you must be hmm, a little bit innovative and flexible. And uh, you also have to act quickly, because when it's on the market, it might not be on the market for very long. I'll get into more of the challenges of equipment as we go. You also need to get yarn, another thing that seems quite simple and straightforward, but indeed it is not, or, or at least it is no longer uh, simple and easy. And then you need to get staff, something else that seems straightforward, but of course what you need are the right people. Um, and as far as I know, there's no Craigslist for the right people. <laughs> So here's the Oriole Mill in my um, artist rendition, which most of you will recognize as using Photoshop filters on a photograph. <laughs> so this is a 72,000 square foot building, originally built as a vegetable freezer plant. Um, and it's located in Hendersonville, North Carolina, which is in the mountains of North, North Carolina, obviously, and just south of Asheville. So this is the inside of the building when we first got it. That's um, our fearless leader, Stefan Michelson, who is um, maybe the gutsiest pe person I've ever known. So if you, if you look at that room, which will eventually become the weave room, you can see that the, there's quite a challenge in taking this beautiful old building and turning it into something that will function. This building had been quite neglected for, well, let's be generous and say 10 years, but really it's, it's much longer than that. So it took a, a year and a half to two years just to get it to the point where we could install equipment and have the right uh, wiring and compressed air. And of course, we had to buy all that copper tubing at the point that copper was the most expensive it has ever been. And um, the challenges are beyond what you can imagine and uh, well, if someone asks you, should you start a mill, the short answer is no. <laughs> so you think that, oh, well, you know, once we get the equipment and get it into the building, whew, that's, that's half, the, half the battle. The reality is that buying equipment in the used market is really a challenge. Um, you must go to many places, and uh, the equipment often looks like this or worse, and you're supposed to evaluate, will this run? It's not running now when you're looking at it in the warehouse and you have to hope that it wasn't, you know, rode hard and put up wet, that, that it can have another life. Oh, by the way, I just wanted you to have a sense of scale. So yes, I'm standing in that photo and no, I'm not on a pedestal. <laughs> so this is what the equipment looks like uh, in the weave room. Um, and at that point, we're actually sharing the building with a carpet manufacturer. So I want you to think that all the messy part is not ours. <laughs> so you might, most people assume that we bought a building with existing equipment in it, because frankly, it's hard to imagine how you install these gantries that are uh, 20 feet up and made of solid steel. And uh, 
well, quite challenging to uh, install. They're really like a giant sewing machine table with a hole in the center, and they support the jacquard heads that sit above the weaving machine, which we refer to as a loom. So what you can't anticipate is perhaps your riggers put the heads on backwards and have to come back and redo it. And uh, apparently you're expected to absorb that cost as well. So you can't really anticipate the cost because there's just so many additional things that, um, well, you wouldn't plan because you would want to avoid them. So <laughs> one of the things that uh, I think most people think of when they think of a factory or, or a manufacturing plant is that they assume that it's kind of the same as, as though you were in plastics where you, know, you wouldn't imagine someone's hand going into molten plastic as part of the process. But the reality is that uh, a jacquard or Dobby weaving mill these days is really a combination of machine and hand, and it's a combination of analog and digital. And for me, that's quite satisfying. Can't tell you exactly why right now, but uh, that seems to use all parts of your brain and um, mm -hmm, make for an interesting work environment. What you're seeing on this uh, slide is the installation of a harness. Harness is those orange cords that uh, connect the hooks in the head to the heddles, which of course lift the warp threads at the loom. This can, harnesses can only be made by hand, and I'm very sorry to tell you that there's not a single entity left in North, Car North America that can make a harness. So we happen to have mm, pretty rotten timing on that. So we were the first customer uh, when there was a joint effort between an American company and an Italian company, and uh, well, they botched our harness. So harnesses, uh, you're paying about $2 per harness cord, and uh, it takes mm, six to 12 weeks to get your harness, and then it can take one to two weeks to install, depending on the number of cords, which relates to the number of hooks and the number of warp ends that you want to control. So I want you to notice there's a human there. <laughs> She's standing up, up above the weaving machine, but below, below the jacquard head. So she's standing for days on end with her hands above her head. It's actually quite difficult work and almost impossible to have perfect accuracy. So what you might not anticipate going in is that you also have to allow several weeks of testing to find all the, mis the misconnections. And by the way, they don't show up in all weave structures. So you have to go through a range of weave structures to flush those out. By the way, in case you ever find this, five end harness structures are the best to flush out those problems because the hooks in the head are all in banks of 16. So if you're using four, eight, or 16 weaves, it can camouflage that problem. And then suddenly you take what you think is perfect fabric off the loom and there's flaws on the back. Ooh, you know, we do struggle um, to be a, a no-waste facility, and that's very easy to say. It's much more difficult to actually um, do in reality. For those people who've never seen the inside workings uh, of a jacquard harness, I just wanted to get a view of what the top of the modules look like. That's in the lower right corner, and then the harness cords and the comber board through which they pass. You can't run a mill without skilled hands. And uh, what we've discovered the hard way is that experience is not the same as expertise. Someone could have worked in a mill for 20 years, but if they were very narrow in their training and perhaps narrow in their interest, uh, they may not be able to make the jump to a true startup where each day you may be asked to do a different job. Um, that's not saying, you know, one day you drive a truck, the next day you're cooking my lunch. I don't mean it that way. It's all related to the mill, but we're too small to have um, too compartmentalized a process. So everybody that's possible is cross-trained, and um, everybody has to fill multiple functions. So there, there is no machine that can thread a jacquard loom. You might be surprised to know that it can only do be done by hand. Now, it is true, once you've threaded, if you're not changing the threading, after that, you can tie to the previous warp. And we have a machine that does that. And frankly, when I was trained as a hand weaver, if you told me there was a machine that could tie one warp <laughs> end to the other with perfect accuracy, I would have said, no way. You know, that's the fine motor skill of a human hand. But indeed, it can. 
but it cannot uh, thread a jacquard. There are machines that can thread a dobby, but I'm told we don't have one of those. I'm told that, uh, that the level of inaccuracy is such that it's better to do it with a skilled human. So you can't do it without the right people. This is Barry Connor, uh, without whom, uh, frankly, I'm convinced our mill would not have survived. He is my right hand in the weave room. He's what's called an overhauler. That's someone who has the ability to take apart a weaving machine or a jacquard head, refurbish all the parts, put it back together, and have it as good as it was when it came out of the factory on its day of birth. Um, that's an amazing ability, and one of the big fears for the future is that who is the next generation of these skilled workers? You know, it's great for us to have um, high ideals and, and lofty goals, but if we don't have the people who know how to do the work, then we can't make quality product. And if we're not making quality, what's the point from, from my perspective? By the way, he was the image in Megan's uh, projected uh, uh, in the ER room. They were learning how to tie a, uh, a weaver's knot from a YouTube video, and that's Barry Connor in the video. <laughs> this is Phyllis Bonham. She's a master warper. Um, what you may not realize, although once I say it, it may seem obvious, is that you can't make perfect fabric from an inferior warp. You can't make a perfect warp from inferior yarn. So often in the United States, the assumption is cheaper, 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 more volume, more volume, more volume. Uh, and in some cases, that can work. In other cases, if you compromise too much on the yarn quality, you, you have many stops while you're making the warp, and you now have degraded the quality of that warp. Now you're, you're going to have many more stops in the weaving production end. And so, yeah, you've paid less for your yarn, but now your fabric has cost you more to produce, um, and you've made a much more inferior product. So for us, Quality starts with the yarn. We buy the best yarn we can find. Um, we had to make decisions early on. Uh, how do we make decisions on, on those hard calls? We want to be sustainable. We want to be responsible. We want to be the best um, citizens that we can possibly be. But it's a lot easier said than done, as I've already mentioned. So where do you get your yarn? That's the question I'm asked as often as, why would you start a mill? Well, we get our yarn from wherever we can, where the quality is, is excellent. If that quality can come from North America, I'm happier than I can possibly tell you. But if I can't get the quality from North America, I have to get it from wherever I can. Because at our scale, it's not a commodity production. So if I use inferior yarn and it pills in the second or third washing, that the value is not there. So ultimately for us, the decision was um, the most sustainable practice is to produce that which never needs to be replaced. And hopefully you don't want to replace it. Let's be honest. The thing that made me lust for this particular building after having looked for years and, um, and, and experienced many disappointments was the light filled weave room or what? I imagined would be the weave room. So the walls, the ceiling is uh, 25 to 28 feet high, and uh, the last five or six feet of that is all glass block on all four sides. So that means that even on a gray day, we have natural light flooding the weave room. That might not seem important to you if you haven't worked in a weave room that has no natural light. Um, Megan's Mill, um, all I can say is it's really enviable. Uh, and they have great light in their weave room, but that's really unusual. I'm often needing to make decisions at the loom. I need, I need the best light so that I can see, um, so I can make decisions. Um, that's, that's simply non-existent in the United States. In Europe, you will see sawtooth roofed mills that allow light to come in. Our understanding is the reason that they had all that glass block was simply to save electricity when they were sorting vegetables. Um, you might notice that there are two heads on, on the top of this weave machine. And now I'm going to talk faster like a Canadian because I've just been given the five minute notice. <clears throat> because we're in the used market, um, the high hook count jacquard heads are quite rare to begin with. 
and even more rare in the used market. So you might have heard the adage, two heads are better than one. In our case, that's, that's how we've approached it. So since we couldn't find the head size that we wanted, we began coupling them, which is a little tricky because they have to act as though they're a single unit, but indeed they're not. So they have to handshake, but they don't know the other exists. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, now I'm going to quickly go through fabrics. I'm not even going to read these to you because I'm assuming everyone in here can read. <laughs> Oi. So the yarn that we use primarily is a long staple Egyptian uh, cotton that's mercerized and gassed. And I hope you're not going to stone me following this presentation because it is clearly not organic yarn. I would love to use organic yarn, but so far our experience is that I haven't found a yarn that's strong enough to survive being a warp. You know, a lot of the organic yarn works really well for knits, but the warp yarn is under a tremendous amount of tension um, when it's put onto the beam, and then it's under a great deal of stress and friction in the act of weaving. So it must be really strong. So if you're going to use a weaker yarn for a warp, it must be coated in order to uh, lubricate and support and strengthen it before it's made into a warp. Well, that adds processes, and it's, uh, then all of that gunk has to be removed from the fabric after finishing. And we simply believe that using the best quality of the yarn means the fewer processes and, and greater longevity. And what we're really after is to produce something that will last forever. Most of you know that uh, thinking of textiles as a commodity is really a recent occurrence in human civilization, that uh, there was a time when textiles were as precious, well, as valuable as precious stones or rare, uh, precious metals or rare stones, and that was because of the time uh, investment, that making textiles is so time intensive that it increases its value. It's really only in the modern age that industrial production has allowed that to, well, evaporate. And even in my lifetime, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Uh, but things have, as, as mentioned earlier, gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And really, I watched that happen. And you know, in the beginning, you think, oh, goody, 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 I can have more. But ultimately, you think, I don't need more. And I'd really rather have a few things that that I really love and are top quality and are timeless and I can wear forever or use forever, whether it's on my bed or on my body, um, rather than to have dozens of options. I do have some fabrics here if anyone's interested in seeing them physically and touching them. Most of the fabrics we produce are reversible. Um, that's, well, I'm a frugal kind of gal and I like the idea that you get a little schmutz, you flip it over, you don't have to launder it right that moment. Um, it also gives... <laughs> It also gives designers and other creative people that use our fabrics a lot more options in how they can play those fabrics and patterns against each other. Uh, so it's a little tricky when the furniture people order fabric because we have to know what they consider the face and we choose to weave it in the orientation in which they need um, because that makes it easier for the finisher. So these are our fabrics obviously in showrooms, which is one of the ways that we um, get our fabrics out into the world. So we produce yardage goods of our own design, but we also produce finished product. We are only able to do that because of the addition of Libby O'Brien to um, the Oriole Mill. She founded uh, her own company called Western Carolina Sewing Company, also referred to as SoCo. It's housed in the Oriole Mill. We are one of her clients. We're not our only client. So um, she's building her business and we're supporting her with infrastructure and equipment in order to expedite and facilitate that. I asked her for um, some images and I asked her to talk about them. She said the collages that I'm about to show you represent the way SoCo relates to her creative practice. So she's got a unique background. She's got um, a degree from FIT and she's also got a degree from School of the Art Institute in Chicago. She worked for a, a Gary Graham in New York City as his production manager. So for me, she's perfect because she understands production, she understands industry, and she understands the fine art design aspect, which is central to the mission of our mill. So because of Libby's presence, we're able to collaborate in a much more meaningful way with a number of other companies. So we did a project with some alpaca growers. Uh, of course, this is a photo of the photo shoot where we had alpacas in the mill. You know, a common experience for most mills in North America. Uh, <laughs> there were many challenges in this project. One was that uh, is, 
it was difficult to find a spinner who could probably sort, sort out the guard hairs and make a soft, luxurious, um, yeah, premium fiber. That's the feed pail. We work with Catherine Ellis. Some of you may know her or know her book called Woven Shibori. So she weaves her fabric on our looms at the Oriel Mill, and then all, all of those uh, pink threads get pulled. You can see the kind of smocking effect. Those uh, create the mechanical resist for the dyeing process. Catherine, by the way, uh, this week is in France for the Shibori Conference, um, and I'm thrilled to tell you that uh, she took scarf blanks with her, and that means um, fabric that we wove at the mill with those pulling threads in place that the students can jump right in to um, pulling and creating pattern out of, uh, out of those uh, pulling threads so that they don't have to invest that front end time at hand weaving. Not to anything against hand weaving. Remember, I was a hand weaver. But it means that they are often more ad, um, adventurous and risk taking than they might be had they invested uh, a lot of time in hand weaving that cloth. This has also allowed her to expedite her research. because She continues to hand weave. We've not displaced that. We haven't replaced it. But it allows her to explore ideas um, much faster because she's got a busy schedule with her travel and workshops. <clears throat> she's become a specialist in natural dyes on cotton. Uh, she's studied with Michel Garcia in France, and uh, he's been instrumental in uh, developing mordants for cotton. When I was in school, natural dyes on cotton looked, frankly, like a bad dye job, or mm, somebody spilled something and stained it a little bit. So these are colors that are vibrant are really um, mind-blowing to those of us who remember a time before where you could only get that kind of saturation and color on wool or, or silk. We also work with a company called Pavo, and they make baby wraps. When they first contacted me, I had no idea what a baby wrap was. I wasn't sure if it was a small edible thing or... <laughs> But for a company that specializes in fabric where the, the structural integrity is the end all be all, the quality is the end all be all, and the reversibility is just as important to us as any other aspect, this is a perfect use of that fabric because, of course, you do see both sides. So one of the beauties of a baby wrap, obviously, is that you are hands-free. You're not um, pushing a stroller. And it means that you can go places where a stroller uh, maybe is not the best mode. I guess I need to learn to press the button before I'm actually ready for the next slide. We'll try it again. OK, so another reversible fabric. And here, of course, structural integrity means even more than you would expect for a bed covering. Um, it's a really like strapping a bowling ball to your body. And you want to make sure that that fabric's not going to stretch or give. And of course, it needs to be uh, that you can launder it, uh, et cetera. We've also partnered with Appalach, which is an outdoor apparel company uh, committed to sustainability. And um, well, I'll let you go to their website. They're a really fantastic company located in Asheville, North Carolina. And of course, I'm showing you a throw, even though they're an outdoor apparel company. But right now, I'm not in a position to make the kind of fabric that they need uh, for their apparel. We're working on that for the future with um, Kent Wool in South Carolina and the uh, uh, wool from Montana, Rambouillet wool. So this is an American cotton with a New Zealand wool. As I said before, I'm happy to use local ingredients whenever possible, but ultimately my responsibility is to guarantee quality and it has to be that it will live uh, lifetimes. We want our textiles to be something that people can inherit. And this is Steffel Michelson, who's the um, owner and co-founder of the Royal Mill and perhaps the the most courageous person I've ever known. 